All right, well, good afternoon. Welcome. We appreciate all of you turning out this afternoon for uh, the Louisiana Diversion and Rivers Forum. My name is Ashley Edwards. I'm president and CEO of the Gulf Coast Business Council. And unlike every other person that will speak on this microphone today, I am not an expert in the topic that's going to be discussed. And in that way, I'm probably like a lot of you in that uh, I have a lot of questions, a lot of questions about uh, what happened this past summer, about what potentially lies ahead as it relates to uh, freshwater intrusion to the, uh, into the Mississippi Sound, and especially in what types of things that we can do locally uh, to make sure that we have a voice in the process. And so it's a pleasure for the Gulf Coast Business Council to co-host this event today with the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources, uh, really designed to make sure that we get some experts here to talk about both what happened and what's going to happen, to begin to answer some of those questions that we all have and provide us with the information that we're gonna need uh, moving forward. Uh, again, would really like to welcome all of you. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to come. I know we have a number of local elected officials from along the Mississippi Gulf Coast that are here today. Can I just ask them to stand so we can recognize our elected officials that came out? Thank all of you for coming, and thank you to the rest of our guests. Uh, we have a number of members of the Gulf Coast Business Council that are also here today, and of course, we think it's very important that the business community is informed about these issues, because we know really that the questions that ultimately surround what the health of, of our Mississippi Sound are critical for, uh, for our future, for our economic future here on the coast, and for really the planning that we're gonna have to do to make sure that we can uh, create a sustainable environment and a sustainable economy based off that environment. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, General Joe Spragan to the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources and I'd like to thank Joe for his leadership in helping to put this together today. Joe. Thank you. Well, first off, Ashley, thank you so much for uh, Gulf Coast Business Council allowing to uh, host this for us and uh, be able to uh, put this together. And we thank you so much for your leadership for the Gulf Coast Business Council. On behalf of Governor Bryant and uh, Governor-elect Reeves, I would like to welcome you for the ones that are not here from Mississippi, but our Louisiana friends that have come over to be visit with us. We thank you for taking the time to come over here today and be a part of this. Um, I would also like to uh, thank Chip for uh, coming from Louisiana. He uh, he has really uh, worked hard with us, and uh, the Louisiana group out of the governor's office is working with us and our governor's office to be able to do the things that need to be done, and we appreciate that. We do thank you so much. I can tell you we're going to have some questions on this, and uh, one way we're going to do it, we're going to have a little orderly fashion of how we have a card in the back, and there's some cards in the back, and you can uh, be welcome to write down a question and if you would address it to who you think or just the panel in, in general that we're going to have later and uh, let them understand and I ask you to please uh, you know be uh, understanding that uh, if you ask somebody a question especially our core friend uh, Joey Wyndham who's with, with us you know a certain thing that, that by law he can only talk about and uh, so if he says he can't understand it okay and uh, he's not trying to, sh to uh, shuck us off he's just a point of that's by law and uh, this today, I want you to understand, is a fact-finding information day. We asked Louisiana to come over and be a part of this with us and uh, to be able to give their, uh, their brief of what their plan is of how they want to do their uh, coastal restoration plan for the future. And uh, we want them to be able to give us that plan and let us listen to that plan and understand. Now, once again, they are very amenable to you asking them questions. If you have a question that you would like to ask, they, you know, please put it down on, and we will bring it up to the panel, and they would be very much appreciative to answer as much as they could of it. The, uh, the briefings we're going to have today, if you look at the CPRA is going to give a brief as they talk about their plan. DMR is going to give a brief, and uh, Paul will do that for about a lower river diversion that is not to Mississippi. And then uh, we have the Corps of Engineers, Mr. Joey Wyndham, and he's going to give us a little overview of the watershed of what he does and uh, the Mississippi River and how it works. Um, we have a great group of panelists that's going to come up shortly after that, and uh, they'll be after the break, and we're going to be able to, uh, we'll introduce them at a later time, so I won't go through it at this time. 
I want you to understand a couple of things. Mississippi and Louisiana are not adverse against each other. We're here together. We both reap a lot of benefits and a lot of heartache off of the Mississippi River and other things that happen. We're here as two teams, and the team Mississippi and the team Louisiana, and our governors, I think, would back this 100%, and our legislators and our senators, that we are here to make a thing work together with each other. Our goal is for both of us to reap the benefits of the Gulf of Mexico and the things that we could do with the Gulf of Mexico. We have a, I think we have a very much same goals in life, and that's to rebuild the estuary and rebuild our Gulf Coast. You know, we got a lot of marshland, a lot of areas that are damaged, and we need to rebuild those because it means a lot for more than just hurricane protection. It also means a lot for what we're gonna have in the future as far as our aquatic life in the, in the Gulf. We need to look at those things and I ask that you please understand that with the Corps of Engineers and NOAA, Mississippi and Louisiana are working hand in hand. And we're working hand in hand to make this a better place. And we're working hand in hand to make this rebuild I mean, all the way back from Katrina, we've had one disaster after the other. And we're trying to find a way together to rebuild after those disasters. And I think that we can do this. And I please, I just ask you that, uh, that you would look at the things that are told today. We're not gonna come out of here with an answer that says this is stamp what we're gonna do 100%. We know what's right, what's wrong. It's not gonna happen today. What we're gonna do today is find out some more information that's going on and, and maybe give people a better chance to be able to brief their, why they're doing what they're doing, why Louisiana thinks this would work and why they want to do what they're doing. And let us understand it too. And maybe we, if in, uh, between us, when I say us, Mississippi and Louisiana and our congressional staffs, maybe we can do something in the, in the near future to be able to uh, help with some of these flooding that's going on and some of the issues that we're having and to be able to rebuild our aquaculture. I, uh, I wanna tell y'all, I'm gonna introduce one person. That's Mr. Vic Marver. And Mr. Victor's sitting down here and I wanna tell y'all something, man. This man knows more about what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico and how to grow oysters and how to grow shrimp and about the aquaculture than probably 99.9% .9 of the PhDs are out here. And Mr. Victor, has t he, uh, he gave me Mississippi 101 about a year ago. And because of Mississippi 101, is what Paul and our, what Paul's gonna brief came out of it. There's a lot of things out there that there's a lot of people, and it's not just Mr. Victor, but I, I, I really appreciate him. And I, I want people to understand there's a lot of people that have knowledge of how to help us. And it's not knowledge that they learned in college. It's knowledge that they learned the hard way. We need to listen to that also, and we're going to. So I would ask you, if you would, to, uh, to please just uh, be uh, very mindful and uh, be respectful, as we always are in South Mississippi and Mississippi, and be respectful to our visitors. And uh, let's take the opportunity to listen to them and see what they have to say. And so at this time, I want to introduce out of the Louisiana Governor's Office is uh, Chip Klein, who is the Assistant for Coastal Activities and the CPR Board Chairman. Chip, thank you so much for coming and we appreciate it. Well, thank you, uh, General Spragans, and, and to you, Ashley, and to the entire uh, Mississippi Department of Marine Resources uh, and the Gulf Coast Business Council for, for having us uh, here today. Uh, as General said, my name is Chip Klein. I serve as Chairman of the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority Board and Executive Assistant to Governor John Bell Edwards for coastal activities in the state of Louisiana. And I want to begin my remarks uh, here today by saying that it is our hope that this meeting here today can be the start of a very productive dialogue between our two states on how we can partner and continue to collaborate together to address the impacts that our coastal communities experienced earlier this year during the 2019 flood season. A flood season that resulted in extensive impacts across the Gulf Coast. From southwest Louisiana in the Sabine Lake area 
across all portions of coastal Louisiana, across all portions of the state of Mississippi, and even into portions of the state of Alabama. We also hope that this meeting will, the beginning, will be the beginning of a productive dialogue as it relates to some of the sediment diversion projects that we are looking to build to restore portions of South Louisiana. So we are here today looking forward to some open and honest conversations with all of you to ensure that Louisiana and Mississippi continue to have the special relationship that we've seen in the past and that we remain on the same page regarding the protection and restoration of Louisiana and Mississippi's coastal areas. In Louisiana, we fully recognize that 2019 has been a hard year for everyone who works and makes a living on the coast here in the state of Mississippi. Louisianans are voicing the same concerns and suffering the same impacts that so many of you are facing here. We understand that this year has been difficult and we understand why you are angry. But it's also important for us to recognize that 2019 was an unprecedented year in the worst way possible. A year that we hope never repeats itself again. This year, the longest opening of the Bonnie Carey Spillway in our state's history occurred in 2019. An unprecedented amount of fresh water flowed through that structure. This, on top of record river levels across the Gulf Coast, and a record amount of rainfall has surely made some lasting negative impacts. As a result, the state of Louisiana has begun conversations with the federal government through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regarding projects that we can build further north along the Mississippi River that would alleviate the need to operate the Bonnie Carey Spillway in future flood seasons at the capacity and the length of time that we saw earlier this year. It is essential that Louisiana and Mississippi continue to partner in looking at ways in which we can minimize future impacts to our fisheries and our coastal communities that we saw earlier this year. However, as I mentioned earlier, we're also here today to talk about some of the restoration projects we are looking to build to restore Louisiana's coast. And so you will hear a lot of things today. And I hope that you believe that we are being sincere and honest in our remarks and our presentations. But if you only hear one thing today, I hope you will hear this. Our sediment diversions are in no way, shape, or form similar to the Bonnie Carey Spillway. Sediment diversions are being designed differently. They are being engineered differently. They will be constructed differently, and they will certainly be operated differently. Additionally, these sediment diversions are also located in an area that has no direct line or path to the Mississippi Sound. To compare sediment diversions that are in Louisiana's Coastal Master Plan and the Bonnie Carey Spillway is completely irresponsible, inaccurate, and it is misleading. The state of Louisiana will have comprehensive operation plans, adaptive management plans, and a series of other mitigation plans and efforts and checkpoints that we must follow to address negative impacts as mandated by federal law, as mandated by the Corps of Engineers, and other several federal regulatory agencies to ensure that any impacts are appropriately and adequately addressed. While some of our projects, and this is important, while some of our projects have been determined to be consistent with federal laws, we are not exempt. We are not exempt from a single federal law for these sediment diversion projects, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And to be totally clear, the Mid-Breton Sediment Diversion, the main diversion of concern here in the state of Mississippi, is still in its infancy. We are still about eight to nine years away from that diversion being operational. We still have to go through a robust permitting process, the environmental impact process, and years 
of engineering and design work. We've not even had many of these conversations with our own coastal residents in Louisiana because we are so early on in the process. So there is still plenty of time, plenty of time for the public to have input, for us to have dialogue and continued collaboration. And those of us that work in Louisiana absolutely welcome that. So those of us who work within the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, as General Spragans noted, we work in close coordination with several officials from the state of Mississippi on numerous fronts, including the Lower Mississippi River Management, watershed region initiatives, and lobbying for additional funding sources from Congress to implement additional protection and restoration projects across the Gulf Coast. And to be crystal clear, no effort, not a single effort that we are working on in Washington, D.C. right now, including an increase in GOMESA revenues, has anything to do with sediment diversions. The state of Mississippi has had representation and continued input to advise on our agency's actions, including the development of our state's coastal master plan with represent representation on the master plan framework development team. The collaboration that exists between our two states has been and is productive. But unfortunately, all of this, all of this has been overshadowed by recent headlines and misinformation circulated through your communities by a small group of individuals, mainly two individuals from Louisiana with a specific agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, and particularly those of you who serve on county boards of supervisors, you have been incredibly misled. You have been provided with inaccurate, overly exaggerated, and deliberately misleading information. And it is a disservice to all of us. These myths and stories that you've heard imply that our projects and initiatives will ruin your coast, fisheries, and livelihoods. And today I'm thankful that we, we have the opportunity to present the scientific details on why that is completely false. We value our coast too much to lose it. And we're fighting like hell to save it. Well, we also appreciate that all of you place the same merit and value in protecting your coast, your um, resources, and your livelihoods. And we have no intention of destroying those as a byproduct of saving our own. To that note, you'll notice that we brought a crew with us today, including CPRE experts, our chiefs in engineering, planning, research, and our executive director, Bryn Haas. All of these individuals have dedicated their lives to implementing the best project that will protect, sustain, and restore Louisiana's rapidly diminishing coastline. They work every day to implement unprecedented solutions for our unprecedented problems, all the while, all the while consistently and continually taking into account every possible negative impact for every project that we build across our coast. So we are here today and we are happy to talk to any of you about any question that you have. We're not here to persuade you to believe in our projects. We just want you to have the right information to hold informed opinions. So we look forward to continuing this conversation today and we remain committed to meeting with any of you at any time and at any place to discuss these issues and remain committed to a lasting partnership with the state of Mississippi. Thank you all for having me. Okay, we're going to move forward in the program here, and uh, one of the things we're going to look at, uh, we have a briefing coming up now, and it's going to be Dr. Paul Mickle from the Department of Marine Resources. Paul is our Chief Scientific Officer and uh, for the Department of Marine Resources. Dr. Mickle is, Dr. Mickle is currently the uh, Chief Scientific Officer for the Mississippi Department of Marine Resources. He received a bachelor's degree from the University of, so of, of Florida and a master's degree from the University of Southern Mississippi, 
and a Ph.D. from the University of Southern Mississippi. After completing the, his education in fish biology, he continued as a researcher at the Mid Gulf Coast uh, Research Laboratory in Ocean Springs, and for more than 15 years, Dr. Mickle has uh, managed to mul through multiple projects and programs focusing on the fish species in Mississippi, both from the commercial and the recreational perspective. His primary focus has been on habitat use, population dynamics, growth, and life his history. He has contributed his research internationally and is the author of multiple uh, peer review research articles in scientific journals. Dr. Mickle currently serves on the Gulf, Co Gulf of Mexico Fisheries Management Council and the Gulf States uh, Marine Fisheries Commission, which are the uh, managing bodies for, of, the, of several federal and state managed fishery species. In the Gulf of Mexico, within his first two years as a chief scientific officer, he has contributed to the creation of multiple programs in the agency ranging from living shorelines, seagrass monitoring, stock enhancement, and tails and scales. But uh, right today, Dr. Bickle is going to talk to us about the Western Mississippi Sound hydrodynamics. And so I appreciate it, and I wish you would please welcome Dr. Paul Mickle. All right, well, I appreciate the, the invitation by the Gulf Coast Business Council to, to give this talk. And uh, Ashley Edwards, as you heard from him earlier, and uh, I'm a quantitative scientist. I give a lot of graphs and figures, but to the Gulf Coast Business Council members, I promise I won't present as many as Ashley does in his talks. And that's an inside joke to all the members out there of the, of the Business Council. But good afternoon, and I appreciate the invite. Uh, but again, today I would uh, really like to share some concepts that the agency has been working on. Now, I would like to share two ideas. First, a Pearl River potential project concept, and use that to show how Mississippi can possibly move forward on other projects. So I'm really using this project that obviously Joe's excited about and I'm excited about, but also use it to give an example of a strategy for the state. And um, it's really been a really exciting thing to talk about, and uh, I'm really eager to share it with here today with y'all, and uh, I really uh, have cherished the input I've gotten back on it so far of, of really um, talking to, to Mr. Marver that uh, Joe mentioned earlier, and, and folks from Louisiana, and, and, and folks from Mississippi, and, and oystermen uh, in particular, and shrimpers, and uh, it's really been an exciting beginning of the process, but uh, I'm just excited to share about it uh, to, to y'all here today. So, um, did the slide advance up there too? Okay, thank you. All right, so just to, to talk a little bit about what the anatomy of the Western Sound, so we're all in the same playing field, um, to understand there's a lot of freshwater inputs that, that come in, and uh, some of them are natural, some of them are, are somewhat unnatural. I put a lot of blue arrows on here showing these are the, the natural uh, you know, rivers of our coastal plain. And I'll start at the east, uh, which is the Wolf River, very small river. Um, the Jordan, very small. The Pearl is the largest river in our state. Uh, the Mississippi River borders our state, but as far as the drainage within our state, the Pearl is a, is, a very, is a fairly large river. And there's lots of very small rivers on the northern edges of Lake Pontchartrain over in Louisiana that, that provide natural input. And I put these uh, yellow arrows because they're, uh, they're anthropogenic or man-made, um, you know, uh, either they're sediment, uh, sediment diversion or, or either flood control structures. And I should have made the Bonnie Carey arrow about 10 times that size, right? But understanding really the concept that I uh, really want to explain and, and hopefully everyone understands is the, the Western Mississippi Sound drove the seafood production that gave Mississippi the number one seafood capital of the world tag for, for uh, close to 100 years. And uh, that, that was it back then. And, uh, and my goal and my career that I focus in on is trying to, get, trying to get back to that production level that really made us famous on a worldwide stage. So these are the projects that I get excited about and I want to talk about, but again, what I'm presenting here today is not a sediment control project or sediment, uh, sediment diversion project or a flood control project. This is a project to restore natural flows, particularly to the Pearl River. And understanding the ecology of the Western Sound and returning something and having the ability to, to return it to a natural flux of salt and fresh water. Because we all understand the Mississippi Sound is an estuary. 
our barrier islands hold in our river water. The marine environment south of our barrier islands is 35 parts per thousand, quite salty. So we have that really interesting balance back and forth, and our coastal plain rivers are driving that. They drove the historical production that you and I always enjoyed. And that's the goal of this talk, is to explain a potential project to head toward that direction. Because I feel very strongly if we start using the drainages, I'm sorry, um, you know, managing the drainages to act like they did 100 years ago, we're going to start to see that production come back. Uh, oysters, shrimp, crabs, that marsh production that drives our economic and recreational economies. Um, uh, let's see, moving on, okay. So, evidence of water quality changes of what we've really seen and why I'm up here of really wanting to, to be able to restore the water quality that we see in the Western Sound. We've seen land loss just like Louisiana, not to the extent of Louisiana, but we do have land loss, especially in the Western Sound. Uh, this top map is just showing the loss of shoreline here. This is Heron Bay and uh, Heron Point there. And then uh, we've actually seen spatial loss of our oyster reefs. So the map in the bottom right-hand corner is uh, showing our historical production on our public reefs. And the water qualities and the variations of water quality of super fresh water in the springtime and ultra salty water in August, late summer is becoming so erratic that literally we have historical reefs that don't have any live oysters on them. And we have a lot of data to support the statements that I'm making here today. As the chief scientific officer, I don't like to say anything without a lot of data behind it. So understanding that and the, just really what's going on to our southern reefs of these, these two uh, green reefs, I know it's too small to see the names on them, but Telegraph and these other reefs down here, they, they become so salty in the summertime because of a bunch of factors that we've actually stopped some of our management, uh, management activities of culching on these southern reefs because they may catch spat, oyster spat in the springtime but they can't reach it to adulthood. So the life cycle's been cut or broken spatially in some parts of the Western Sound. So what I'm gonna present here today is really understanding about building that cycle back. And we may never get our marshes and rivers looking like they did 100 years ago, but I'm sure with our capabilities and the knowledge in this room and on the Gulf Coast in Louisiana, we can sure get them functioning like they did and getting our marshes working like they used to. I'm a firm believer in that. So, um, all right, so here's, the, here's the, one, the one complicated figure I'm gonna present here today. But I actually did this analysis yesterday morning. I fixed a cup of coffee, I, I got my computer cranked up and I started running it, and it really astonished me and it got me so uh, wide-eyed about what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about here in a second is uh, I've decided I'm probably gonna do a manuscript and try to get this, uh, get this out because I, it was so compelling to understand. But I really wanna make sure that I, I make this clear about what's going on uh, with water quality in the Western Sound and have data behind my statement. So uh, I'm gonna come around here and use the laser. So to understand, this, is, this figure here is just, uh, it's, it's actually just data from one point right smack in the, in the Mississippi Sound and it's looking at conductivity. Both figures are conductivity, which is a conjure of salinity. So it's essentially salinity values. So if you look at this, this is the mean value for each year, the column. If you actually look at it from 1999 to 2019, so it's a good 21 years of data, minus two years of data, because after Katrina, you can see the gap here, the, the sand, the, the equipment was gone, and it took a couple of years to get it back. But USGS did a great job getting it back. We uh, financially uh, share the costs of, of these water quality stations, so it's a wonderful relationship, and I, I trust the data implicitly. So understanding that these are the mean values, if you look at the pretty much from 2008 on, it. It bounces around which estuaries do, and that's fine, but it doesn't look that bad if you look at the average salinity or the average conductivity for that point in the sound. This figure is the alarming one that really scared me and I actually dropped my coffee when I saw it. When the computer finally finished it, it blew my mind because the, these values are the, um, the standard deviation. So that's the variation, not the mean. So you can have a bunch of high numbers and a bunch of low numbers. If you take the average, it's right in the middle, or it's the average of all the numbers, right? Not in the middle, but it's the average of all the numbers. This, these values here along in this figure is the swings of salt and fresh waters back and forth. So the higher up on this axis, the higher these points are, the more variable, the more the needle swinging from salty to fresh, salty to fresh. And you can see in 1999, 
I mean, there's natural variation as we see weather patterns and all these things, and our rivers are acting different each year because of rainfall and ground discharge. But if you look at what's going on here all the way up to 2019, the trend is, is very clear of a trend line that it's going up. Over a span of the 21 years, the variability of water quality in the Western Sound is increasing. So this is very alarming to oyster scientists, to ecologists, to, to marsh ecologists, to understanding seafood production. We've got to do something here to try to control because our Western Sound is like a car spinning out of control. We got to get it back uh, hooked up on the road where it's, it's understanding those natural swings which our aquatic species have really evolved with and can really not be uh, osmotically stressed over. Right now, our oysters, shrimp, and crabs in some areas of the Western Sound are obviously so stressed out by, by uh, Bonnie Carey openings and, and fresh water being blasted through and then the salt water coming in late summers that they're osmotically stressed and they're so stressed out they can't grow fast, they're having trouble reproducing, and this is the loss in production that I'm speaking of. All right, so moving on, um, hopefully I made the point clear enough of really the need for what um, I guess all the eco -restore restoration projects are, are hopefully aimed at as far as um, uh, returning uh, marsh production and seafood production back to, back to historical levels. But we haven't just figured this out. I want everybody to know that. We've, been, we've known this for a very long time. We've known it long enough to uh, partner with DEQ. They were uh, Mississippi DEQ. They were very wonderful to obviously listen to our concerns with the beginning of the BP oil restoration uh, NIFWIF funds, and they uh, funded uh, two projects. One was a, a hydrodynamic uh, model on the Pearl River itself, because obviously we understand that the Pearl River is very important, driving our salinity regimes in the Western Sound. And then a separate model to look at the hydrodynamics in the Western Sound, uh, done by Mississippi State, um, which is that left map there. The right map uh, is the Pearl River hydro model done by Tetra Tech, which is based out of Jackson. So this is not a new concept. This is not a new warning of what's going on. We've known it for a while. But really understanding the hydrodynamics drives spatially of what we can do and how we can do it. So we're finally starting to, to have really good sound science uh, show up and uh, provide that model directionality that we need to, to use towards some of our project decisions. So let's talk about the Pearl River. Um, this, is the, this is the project that uh, really we've, we've grabbed hold of here uh, as of late, and we're, we're really the models have just been completed in the last six months of the ones I just mentioned, so that is perfect timing to open the stage up for, for discussions of this project. Uh, just a little background about the Pearl. Like I said, it's the largest one in our state. Uh, discharges in the Lake Pontchartrain through the western uh, mouth. It actually has two mouths to it, an east and a west Pearl. You drive over it all the time when you're on I-10 or I-90 heading to New Orleans. And then um, the East Pearl actually dumps out into Heron Bay. And it is a large drainage. It's a flea compared to the Mississippi River, obviously. But as far as the, uh, in Mississippi, our state, it's a big river. It's twice the size of Pascagoula almost. It's just about uh, twice the size of Pascagoula, which is a large river as, as well. But obviously, it's a very important uh, factor when, it, when you think about what's driving our salinity regimes in, in the Western Sound. And it's seen a lot of flow changes. It's a heavily manipulated drainage. Um, it's got a large dam on it. Um, it it's been uh, somewhat controlled for navigation, raising and lowering water levels. Uh, it's been manipulated for flood control, industry, access, and agriculture. Um, it's a very complicated system. It's much more complicated than the Pascagoula River. Um, this is an image here of actually looking at the main stem of the Pearl River, which comes down here, this is the main pearl, and then it splits. This is the East Pearl, and this is the West Pearl here. And what I want to talk about today is what's really happened to the pearl. And over time, uh, back in the 60s or 70s, they started to see decreases of flow in the Eastern Pearl to the Western Pearl. And this is for a various number of reasons, but as decreased flow in the East, it slows down in the East. The water slows down, and more sediment drops out and it gets shallower and shallower, so it's a compounding positive feedback problem. So what happened, uh, this is nothing new I'm presenting here today, I'm presenting a new spin on it and a new complete design concept, but what the problem with the East and West Pearl has been around for 
40, 50 years of understanding we need to get equal flows between the East and the West, Pearl, because that was the historical flows that, we, well, that we've seen. But what happened in the 90s was the Army Corps of Engineers listened and they built a, a control structure to push water from the West to the East Pearl. And it was located at Waukeye Bluff, that green dot right there. That's called Waukeye Bluff. And just for scale, Picayune, Mississippi is literally due east of here, about, about 10 miles. Just so you know kind of where that map is. But the problem is the western pearl is lower in elevation than the eastern pearl. So the Waukeye structure, the Waukeye Bluff structure that was completed in the, in the mid-90s uh, to push water up in, uh, into the eastern pearl to get 50-50, 50% in the western part and 50% in the eastern part, what actually happened was it's now pushing water uphill. This is an elevation map, and these pink uh, and purple colors are lower elevation. And these greens is pretty much the same elevation as the main stem pearl and the eastern pearl. So the flow discrepancies between east and west pearl uh, from the sediment dropping out and a number of reasons, the eastern pearl river just got shallow on itself. And when that happened, you're now pushing water uphill because of the Waukai Bluff structure. So when you push water uphill, it creates back pressure. So the, wa the water starts backing up on itself on the main stem of the pearl. So what actually happened when this structure was completed, water started backing up on itself because they're, they're forcing it to go uphill when it wants to go downhill. So what actually happened was up here, this is the main stem of the pearl, it broke through the swamp and started flowing back to the western pearl. It wanted to go to the west, and they, they, it went to the west. So it's going to do what it does. And if, if y'all can figure out how to get water to go uphill, uh, it'll beat the design I'm about to pitch here today. But understanding that, so here's Waukai Bluff structure. This was the one created by the Army Corps of Engineers to push water to the east and push water and to let water go back to the west for a 50-50 split. The back pressure built up and then broke through and wanted to go back downhill to the western pearl. So now we're sitting at about average 85% flow down the western pearl, 15% flow down the eastern pearl. And you can see uh, the concerns that we all have. And this is a long running story, right? That we've actually taken a shot at fixing this and obviously it didn't work. But again, this is not a new problem, but it, it really brings the point home that I think we're onto something here. If we can get the eastern and western pearl acting like they did 100 years ago, we're gonna to start to see benefits from it as far as water quality, as far as natural ecosystem, historical production of that needle not swinging so far back and forth on the gauge, but getting to do what it used to do. The Bonnie Carey is, not, is a separate conversation. I'm working on a natural system to return it to normal. If we can get other structures to mimic natural things, I promise things are gonna uh, start uh, attempting to head that way toward uh, natural production. So the, the, really the understanding is to maybe do a point diversion, of a point source diversion to get, this is the western pearl here, this is the eastern pearl here. Here's I-10 crossing right there toward New Orleans going that way. The le it's level playing ground here. There's no elevation differences if you move down to the, to the lower end. The Mississippi Western Sound, we want water. We want it to do what it did a long time ago. So if we do a cut right here, it's less, than a, it's less than a mile to do water from the Western Pearl to the Eastern Pearl and get them out coming out the Eastern Pearl and the Western Pearl like it did 100 years ago. We feel confident from our production models that we can start to see historical uh, levels of what we've seen as far as what's coming out of the Pearl, what, what drives our salinity regimes uh, in the Western Sound. Now, Bonnie Carey openings, flood control structures, those are a more complicated process from a regulatory side. But again, what the state of Mississippi fo is, is focusing on, what my job is here to make sure that the natural uh, marine resources are at a sustainable level and we en end up getting historical production is, is the main goal in this particular project. This project is not gonna change everything. This is a piece of the puzzle that works forward. But I consider this a very viable project that could really uh, add to the to really the, the motions of what the sound used to do and have that, that salinity regime that we saw here um, 100 years ago, or even just, just 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So uh, this is actually my last slide, and uh, let me check the time, but this is my concept that I really wanted to, to um, understand and, to, and to, to share with you all. 
So really, what we want to really look at as far as this Pearl Project I'm, I'm talking about here today and others is understanding the habitat suitability index for our aquatic species. And uh, I'm going to use oysters as an example because it seems like everybody wants to talk about oysters, so let's go ahead and do it. So we understand in the international as well as the national and the local literature, scientific literature, peer-reviewed literature, exactly what habitat the oyster needs as far as water quality. We know it so well, we can grow them artificially uh, in labs at such fast rates that they're so happy they get exactly what they need as far as salinity, fresh water, and food. We know it really well. So why can't we apply that on a spatial scale to the Mississippi Sound? So identifying exactly what water quality we need for our reefs of the Mississippi Sound as well as Western Louisiana. Eastern Louisiana, sorry. Eastern Louisiana. I'm, I'm thinking of Western Sound, Mississippi. But identifying spatially exactly what you need and then allowing that to drive what these rivers and control structures need to provide spatially into the area. So let's go down to the answer to the equation, right? And find out exactly what our aquatic species need as far as water quality. And then look backwards. Does this project, I'm talking generically, does this project bend the needle back to a more natural um, salinity regime which fits the, the habitat suitability for oysters just right or not? If a project does not support or maybe move the needle in a bad direction, then obviously I, uh, the state should probably look into that and, and obviously not support it. And if it is, then, then uh, a project that comes from Louisiana that's, that's really beneficial and, and moves the needle in the right way for, for suitability of water quality uh, for a certain species or all the species, then obviously I think the state um, should obviously support that in a way. Increased water quality will get our beaches back open more. It'll uh, increase our seafood production. It'll cause a more resilient coast from an ecological perspective. It'll build marsh. The production levels will be high. So that's the overall goal. So this is my last thing that I'll talk about here today is, is to really allow the spatial uh, suitability index or the water quality for each species drive the support, the project support for the state of Mississippi. And I use the Pearl River example as just kind of a platform to show, well, we're gonna run these HSIs with these models that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. If the Pearl River, let's just say that if we restore it to historical flows, if it's not a good thing and it actually causes things to be saltier or too fresh, then obviously we're not gonna support it. But the concept is to let the science behind exactly what the habitat suitability is for our species drive our support. Uh, of, of, of all potential projects, spatially that, that may impact the, the state of Mississippi, as well as the Mississippi Sound. Now, it gets very complicated when you think about flows being very high in certain times of the year and flows being very low in other times of the year. This is a really complicated uh, dance of understanding, and that's why I always lean on what did it do naturally 100 years ago. That's the guidebook we should be looking at. Like I said before, we'll never get the Gulf Coast looking like it did 100 years ago from an ecological marsh perspective, because we've lost it through natural processes and other things like that. But I firmly believe we can get it producing and acting and functioning like it did, because of all the amazing science that we have available to us, as well as our understanding of really what it used to be and, and heading toward that. Uh, our production, our water quality, the nutrients that we have in our water, it's all there. We just need to highlight it and provide structures and projects that'll really keep that needle back to back in those ranges of what uh, we've really seen. So, Joe, that's uh, that's all I have to uh, to say today. And I We're going to do something a little different. All right, I said that you know flexibility was key to air power in the Air Force, so that's what we're going to do here. Paul has to leave, and he's not going to be able to stick around and uh, answer questions because he did, he graciously changed his schedule today for me to be able to instead of flying out now, he was supposed to be on an airplane. He changed it to catch the next flight. But if anybody has a question, I'm going to open it up and allow you to ask Paul a question about his presentation, if that's all right. Paul, we've got about five or six minutes. Sure, absolutely. Okay, hang on one second. I've got Mr. John Dane back here. So the question was, is there funding in place for, for the diversion I presented here, Mr. Dane? Yeah, so there's potential funding uh, in, a, in multiple sources. Um, really. To move forward, the funding is going to be really directed toward the studies of dragging it in spatially to look exactly how much water needs to come out of that eastern pearl to get what we want. And then there's, there's actually uh, more uh, studies that need to be done on exactly where does that diversion 
need to go to the east. I'm not an engineer, I'm an, I'm an ecologist, so we need to get the engineering and the flow dynamics to understand exactly where to put that. Um, and then it's, it's a real dance. We have, to, we have to obviously get with Louisiana because Louisiana uh, owns the land where everything I'm talking about is going to go. They own the they, it's state land between the east and west pearl. So we're going to have to get with them. But I've, uh, I mentioned before, the oystermen uh, in Louisiana have been in support of this project uh, heavily from the beginning. And uh, I'm excited about it, but um, I'm very optimistic that uh, the funding uh, will be there. And uh, everyone seems to be on board. And if, if something's popping up, against it, I'd like to hear it at some point in time. Somebody that's told me NIF Whip would fund this, is that good? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dane's on NIF Whip committee, I was just yanking this chain. <laughs> Thank you. What makes you pick 1919 as a, as a baseline target date for restoration? I would think that that, you know, you're still living with rain follows the plow and philosophies like that. and the environment of the Mississippi Sound would be no more natural in 1919 than it would be in 2019. It would seem to be better to, to pick a baseline of 1819, of 200 years ago for I, I restoration. Would, yes, thank you for that. I, I would agree with you 100%, except I don't have fisheries landings from 1819. I do have fisheries landings from 1919 showing what we were landing as far as production. So that's the data that I can lean on as far as production levels of, of natural production. But again, yes, it's, it was more natural in 1819. But um, the starting point of, of let's say, well, in stock assessments, we usually, that's the beginning of the data. But yes, if I had data to show what production, seafood, or I'm sorry, ecological production was in 1819, I would definitely use that if possible. Okay, is there any other questions? If not, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, all right, thank you very much. I'm very informative on that and we appreciate it. Next up, we have Mr. Joey Wyndham. He is the Chief of the Corps of Engineers, Mississippi Valley Watershed Division. Uh, Joey is a, the Chief of the Watershed Division for the Mississippi Valley Division, the U.S. Corps of Engineers, and the staff member to the Mississippi River Commission. In the position, he is responsible for overall supervision of regional operation for the water management and hydrologically, hydraulic and coastal engineering within the Mississippi Valley Division. The Watershed Division supports evaluations and uh, brief investigations and planning of hydrologic and environmental and river engineering features of the uh, major flood control, navigation, and environmental restoration projects. Mr. Wyndham also serves as the uh, Mississippi Valley Division Senior Water Control Advisor and the Water Control Community of Practice Leader. Uh, Joey graduated from the University of South Alabama in 1997 with a master's degree in, in environmental science and in 2003 from Mississippi State University with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering. He's also earned his master's degree in civil engineering and concentration on water resource engineering in 2010 from Mississippi State University. He is recognized as a Diplomat Water Resource Engineer by the American Academy for Water Resource Engineers. Previous roles before accepting the position of Watershed Division Chief at, for the Mississippi Valley Division, including serving as the Chief of a Hydrological and Hydraulics Branch for the Vicksburg District of the Corps of Engineers and Chief of the Modeling Branch and Assistant Director of the Corps Modeling, Mapping, and Consequent Production Center. As you can tell, he's got a pretty good resume, and uh, I think he will brief you. I uh, heard his briefing the other day, and I'd like to welcome Joey. And Joey, thank you so much, and I uh, look forward to hearing from you. All right, I'm gonna talk about 2019 flood and uh, just what happened. Uh, unprecedented, as mentioned, in a lot of ways. Uh, 
we passed more water at one time than we did in 2019, but uh, we haven't passed the volume that we did in 2019. Uh, very long flood indeed. Um, and before I talk about it, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Mississippi watershed. It's really, um, it's, it's hard to understand the flood without understanding the watershed. And uh, I'm going to talk about that first. So the Mississippi River watershed, sometimes you hear we carry the nation's water. Uh, and that's true. 41% uh, of the, uh, the United States, uh, 31 states, two Canadian provinces, uh, flows to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, 610. 1,000 CFS average, um, UK, we carry 2.3 million CFS in 2011, uh, huge river, third only to the Congo and the Nile River. So this, this kind of breaks down the watershed a little more. So this is the major contributors. The Missouri River, largest by land area, uh, but does not contribute the most water to the Mississippi River. The Ohio River, on average, contributes 60% of the water that we see at Baton Rouge, uh, or we see at Cairo, Illinois. Uh, so you got the Upper Miss, you got the Missouri River, and you got the uh, Ohio River. Then you got the Arkansas, uh, and then you got the Red River. So let's break that down a little bit more. So we break down those percentages. 60% of the water on average, I said, comes from the Ohio River. But let's take it, let's, let's sum it at Cairo, Illinois. So 60% of that water, would come from Ohio, you'd have about 19% come from the Upper Miss, about 10% from the Lower Missouri, and about 1% from the Upper Missouri. Now, the Upper Missouri, you hear a lot about the snowpack. The snowpack in North Dakota and South Dakota, how it affects us down here. But once you, you've got these huge reservoirs on the main still Missouri, once they meter out that water, it's really a very small amount of what we see down here that actually gets here at a peak flow. So it's really about the lower Missouri. The really the takeaway that I want you to hear from here, from this slide is, is that 90% of the water that makes it to the Gulf of Mexico is already in the river at Cairo, Illinois. That's about 20 travel days uh, from the Gulf of Mexico. It's about 1,000 miles north of the Gulf of Mexico. That's 90% of the water is already in the river. And then the Arkansas, the white, uh, make up the rest of that 10%. So that's, that's an astonishing fact. <clears throat> so 2019, uh, big flood, but it's really about four floods. You could break it down a lot of ways, but I broke it down to about four floods. So what you see here, it's kind of hard to see, but basically it started raining in September. Large rainfall in September, October, November, brought the river up. Where it flood stays at Cairo, Illinois, you know, before the first of the year. All right, so we get up, we never come down. So we go into December, you know, another high rainfall month, January, not so much. And in February, we have another huge rainfall in the Ohio River. And then we have enough rainfall north to keep it high, and then the plains kick up in March. Uh, along with the snow melt and all the rain, March, April, we have another flood. Uh, so with all that water, 41%, continental United States all comes in the same spot. So it was really four floods that were spread out that kept us up so high. And I'm gonna walk you through that. All right, so this is, what you're looking at here, this is a telling slide. So this is departure from normal. If you go all the way back to October of last year to June, this is departure from, we've got about 125 years of record that NOAA keeps. So if you take departure from that normal, this is what you see. So where you see purple or you see pink, that's departure anywhere from 15 to 20 inches. So between that time frame, you see that pink, you see the purple, that's 20 inches departing from normal that we would receive normally in that time frame. So if you see where that's located, that's all coming to us. And uh, that really tells you just how much rainfall we dealt with this year. So here's another way to look at it. So NOAA's, this is 125 years, so they ranked those, well, it was 144 years at that time. So they ranked those by region, right, by state and then by region, the wettest on record. So when you see 124, that's the wettest ever, all right? So then if I click this again, that's the Mississippi River, the main tribs. You can see that that's the wettest on record for most of the tribs in 124 years. 
So you could see where the water was coming from. So again, 124 years of record, 124 means it's the wettest on record. All right, so when you sum all those up with a nationwide, this year was the wettest on record. All right, so this just kind of breaks down what I said about the full rain, four events. So September, January, above normal rainfall of the whole watershed. That's event one. February to March, real, real heavy rains over the Ohio River, Tennessee, Cumberland. Remember, we get 60% of the flow from there. So May, May we have snow melt, then we have high rains over the lower Missouri. That's your fourth one. And then after all that, then June comes, we have the high rainfall over uh, the plains. So that meets up the water coming down from Cairo. All right, so this, this top left slide is on average, right? So 60% from the high, 30% from the rest, all right? So that's average, so you look at the top right, this is early on in the year. Because of all the rain coming off the Ohio, we were getting 70% of the flow that we see at Cairo from the Ohio River, all right? So the Tennessee, Cumberland, remember Nashville, all those towns, very high floods. So we were getting pounded from that side. Okay, then it switched. Then at one point in time, we were getting about 50% from the upper mist of the Missouri and only 30% from the Ohio. And then later on, it switched again, where we're getting 43%, 32%. So it's just kind of telling you that it wasn't one flood. I mean, it just kept switching parts of the nation, turning on the nozzle, but it's all feeding to the same spot. All right, so this is a good graph. On the y-axis, you're looking at stage. All right, this is a Cairo. This is the head of the funnel. All right, so stage on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Where you see yellow, we take that 125 years, that's considered average, all right? So if you're in that yellow band, you're in the average range. If you're in the blue above the yellow, that's considered high. If you're below it, that's considered below, all right? In fact, if you look at the very top of that blue line, if you're touching that line, you're setting the daily record of all time, all right? So you can see the rainfall in September, Jumped us all the way up to the top. So we jumped up here in September from the rainfall. This is at Cairo, Illinois. So we're at daily highest ever. All right. So the rainfall, different parts of the country, all coming to the same spot. Oh, I'm sorry. All coming to the same spot. Just kept us up, all right? So the river never came down. All right, this carries us into 2019. All right, so we stay high. All the different rain from different spots, we just carry. It's not until July that we fall below flood stage at Cairo. So this water that comes here takes about 20 days to get to the Gulf of Mexico about 15 days to get to New Orleans. All right, so that kind of tells you the story of the 2019 event. All right, so this is Baton Rouge. So about 12 days travel time below, but you can see us jump up, you know, a little bit later toward October and do the same thing. All right, so Missouri River, all that rainfall coming on the Missouri River, the impacts. This is just kind of a telling slide. Had 1.4 million acres flooded, 5,000 plus structures. Tons of reservoirs uh, reached their spillways, uh, record pools on so many of the reservoirs. Again, all that water coming this way. Tons of levees over top, uh, both federal and non-federal uh, uh, levees. Uh, 17 federally constructed, 53 non-federally constructed, and non-private non -private levees were uh, overtopped or failed. Upper Miss, same thing. Uh, 682,000 acres flooded, <clears throat> 8,000 plus structures. Illinois River, same thing. Levees overtopped. Um, four federally constructed levees, two non-federally, and one private levee overtopped. Same thing, Arkansas River Basin. So you get the point whole nation experiencing very, very high floods. Uh, <clears throat> Yazoo Basin, 
Yazoo Basin, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but when the Mississippi River is high, the Yazoo Basin is not, the Yazoo River is not able to flow out. And as part of the MRT project, it is not complete. And water just kind of ponds there. Uh, so they had a very impactful year there, had over 5,000, 500,000 acres impacted there. All right, so just some good screenshots, the confluence. This is just a good overall shot of the whole entire uh, valley. All right, so this is some NOAA slides. Uh, this really tells the story. If you look on the right, the highest number of days that we've been a flood stage before on record was 97 at Cairo. This year, we were above flood stage for 156 days. Uh, wherever you see red, we broke the record. Uh, you can see Greenville, Mississippi, Vicksburg, Mississippi, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And that is an effect of all those different events occurring at different times, uh, coming to the f same spot and just stretching the flood out. 211 days flood flood stage at Baton Rouge. So I mentioned we carried, we've carried more volume of water than we've ever carried this year. So this is peak flow. So 2011, we carried 2.1 million CFS at Cairo. This year, we carried 1.6 uh, million CFS at Cairo. For Baton Rouge, we carried uh, 1.38 as opposed to 1.4. So it didn't carry the peak. So the good thing about this event, some of those events didn't line up, but then again, it was just a strong, you know, a, a drawn out flood. I need some water. All right, so this is a graph just saying what I said. So in September of this year, we had already passed more water in any other year than we ever have. Uh, just telling the story of how much water we actually passed this year. So I mentioned all the, the levee overtoppings on both the Missouri, the uh, Arkansas, the Upper Miss, the Illinois. All right, so when we hit Cairo, Illinois, after the 1927 flood, we have what's called the MRT project. Uh, that's the Mississippi River and Tributaries Project. So it is very unique, uh, one of the most successful civil works projects uh, ever. Uh, so it's different. In fact, in the Missouri, all those different places, they have levee systems designed to different flood events. All right? Maybe some levees may be designed to like a 50-year event, 100-year event. All right? The MRT system is designed to one mega flood. All right? We call it the PDF project design flood. So basically, after the 1927 flood, 1928 Flood Control Act, you know, I said, core, go build a system to carry project design flood. All right. So the project design flood is a hypothetical flood that took several floods that happened in 37 and 20, um, basically critically arranged those, to come up with this hypothetical flood that was the largest that could reasonably happen is a kind of a simply simplified way to say it. And so everything in the system is designed to carry that flood. So what you're looking at here is the graphic on the right. This is the design of the PDF or our system to carry the PDF. This is no different than the roof load on your house, all right? This is the, the beams on this building to carry a certain uh, load. This is the design to carry a load of CBS, CFS, all right, to, to carry that PDF flood. That's what's unique about it. So everything we do to operate this system is to carry that flow, all right? So as I mentioned, it was designed based on these hypothetical floods. So I'm going to talk about just how it's operated. So the backbone of that system is levees, all right? So that's the main feature, but it's also the whole concept is room for the river. It has floodways, we have backwater areas, we have dams. Uh, it's, it's all a system that works together. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each one of those and how it works and how we operated it this year. All right, so first bullet in the gun is Kentucky Barkley Dam. Kentucky Barkley Dam is located on the Ohio River just before the confluence of the Arkansas and the Mississippi River. So when the Mississippi River is up, 
we're going to operate those dams. We're going to save that storage, and then we're going to operate those dams to make sure that we minimize the stage on the Mississippi River. All right, so we're going to hold that storage right before the peak's coming. We're going to stop flow from those dams, and we're going to minimize that, that peak on the Mississippi River. That's our first bullet. So once we've exhausted all that storage in those two dams, then our second one is the Birds Point and Magic Floodway. So here's the two dams. There's only a, a day and a half travel time between those dams and the main stem. All right, so this is our first floodway in our system. It's called Bird Point and Magic Floodway. It's the only, only floodway that we have to operate by explosives. So once we've exhausted that, we're gonna, we're gonna activate this floodway. It's gonna take water from the Mississippi River, put it through this floodway. It's gonna drop stages along the Mississippi River and it's gonna protect all this area in yellow. And the way it protects that is, it maintains the integrity of the Mississippi River levees. All right, so that's, that's the first major uh, feature of the MRT system. All right, so I'm gonna move downstream. So we have several uh, backwater areas on the Arkansas River and on the White River. This is the Yazoo Backwater River, Yazoo Backwater area. Main still Mississippi River coming down, Yazoo River comes in, all right? This is a bowl. This is a levee that's built along this low-lying delta area. Because when the Mississippi River is up, the Yazoo River can't flow out, so it backs up. This levee wasn't here, all that water would back into the Mississippi Delta. So they see a lot of flood protection just from this levee, all right, low-lying area. Problem is, though, when the Mississippi River is up for a long time, just like it was this year, this can't flow out. So it backs up, but all these rivers interior to this are receiving interior rainfall, all right? So there's gates on here that we close, because if we didn't close them, it would just keep backing in, right? So we close those gates. So just like this year, it keeps raining for months and months and months. This bowl just keeps filling up. So this is one part of the MRT project that is not complete. So normally, if the project was complete, there's a pump here. The pump would pump out of this bowl into the Yazoo River that would relieve this area inside here. All right? So, so you're pumping water out of this bowl into the Yazoo River to get into the Mississippi River. So what effect does it have downstream? You get asked that question a lot. So if I took this year's event, is 1.84 million CFS flowing in the Mississippi River? 1.84 million CFS? 14,000 CFS, a right, very small amount. It's unmeasurable uh, when you put it in 1.8 million CFS. Also, the water you pump to here goes into the Yazoo River. Again, remember, this is high, this can't flow out. The Yazoo River actually flows backwards, all right? So this is just pumping into a lake. It all stays in the storage, so it has no downstream effect. Uh, anyway, this is a major part of the MRT system and it is not complete. Um, and that's why they had so ba such bad flooding in that area this year. All right, this is just a good picture. Uh, this is 2011, but this is how backwater areas work. This is the Mississippi River, river side of the levee, all right? If this levee wasn't here, this side would be as high as this side, all right? But here's the problem this year, this rose, you can't pump from here to here because there is no pump. So this is a good picture. All right, so I'm gonna move downstream, MRT project. Old River Control Structure, another major feature in the MRT project. So this is just a good slide. This is, this is kind of a simplification, but this is, so if you went back in geologic time, this would be coastal Louisiana, so the pass of the Mississippi River. These deltas are building coastal Louisiana. All right, these are just different paths of the Mississippi River. All right, present time. 1950, Congress enacted us to build the old river control structure. Purpose of the old river control structure is to take 
the water that's coming down the Mississippi River, add it to the water that's coming down the Red River, they get a total. So let's just say that there's a, there's a million CFS when we add that up. All right, total the Red River and the Mississippi River. We're going to operate the old river control structure such that 70% of that water is going to continue down the Mississippi River and 30% of it is going to go down <clears throat> the Atchafalaya River. All right, the main purpose of that is to keep the Mississippi River in its current alignment. That's the purpose of the old river control structure. This is just a good historic Red River used to flow separate from the Mississippi River, a meander in the Mississippi River, caught the Red River, Kite Street's cut off, 1830s for navigation. Eventually, the river did like this. Now you only, you only had the, the uh, old river connection. All right, so back to the percentage. This is before the old river control structure. This is the percentage that was flowing down. You can see it 70, 100%. This was coming to 70. This was going to 30. This is in 50s when we stopped it. Okay, a huge study was done in the 50s that 70, 30 was the optimal operation or the optimum amount that should be going down each river. All right, that was a determination and that is how, how the, the structure is currently operating. How is it done? It's by a complex. Uh, we've got three structures uh, at that, and the, basically they're all operated to make sure at the end of the day that 7030, that we hit that 7030. All right, continue on with the MRT system, Morganza. How does Morganza work? So Morganza, if you go back to that, that piping diagram or that design diagram, the PDF flow, the way it's operated is that we're not the way we're authorized is we're not to let more than 1.5 million CFS go past Morganza or down to Baton Rouge. So when we get a flow just like this event, the diversion at 7030 is already done. So if we have over 1.5 million CFS in the river, that triggers the operation of Morganza. All right? It's clearly spelled out that that's how it should be operated. Uh, so this year, so twice we almost operated. So I mentioned there's about a 15-day travel time. Uh, so we're forecasting, I'll take the second peak. So the second peak, we had all that water coming down from up north, and then we had the plains kicked up. So the Arkansas River was flowing out of the dams. There was 500,000 CFS that was forecasted to make it to the main stem. All right. So if that water makes it to the main stem, when the water comes down from the north, we're going to top that 1.5 million CFS. So we put everybody on alert in those parishes, we're going to have to operate most likely. So the Arkansas River has never flowed 500,000 CFS. And so when we got up that high, basically levees were over top, storage was activated, that had never been activated. Uh, so at the end of the day, all that 500,000 didn't make it to the main stem at the right time or the wrong time. Um, and so even though we were very, very close, we put everybody on activation. We never hit that 1.5 million CFS, uh, so we didn't have to operate uh, Morgan. That's you know that is how the decision was made. So Bonacary, so Bonacary, the way it is laid out is it is we hit 1.25 million. The levees downstream are designed to carry no more than 1.25 million CFS with adequate freeboard. So when we hit the 1.25 million CFS at Bonacary, we're going to open Bonacary. And uh, this year, we hit it. Uh, we hit it twice. Um, and so it's the first time ever that we've had to operate it, like someone uh, mentioned earlier. So Bonacary takes water from the Mississippi River and puts it, as mentioned, uh, into Lake Pontchartrain. Second time, I mean, two times we operated it, the longest we've ever operated it. Uh, in the latest in the year that we've ever operated. So this is a really good graph. This is all the times that we've operated, had to operate Bonacary uh, in the past. These are the two the first time in February, and here the second time starting in May. But what's unique about this is 
We've never went past June when we've had Bonacari open. So this is very late in the year that we had Bonacari open. And if you see the rankings right here, 2019, we were open. Uh, we had 79 bays open. And the cumulative volume, uh, when you add the two together, was the most we've ever had to put through Bonacari. So this is a very good graph. So another thing that was unique about this year's flood. So this is, this is a hydrograph like going on here, but this is 2019, the blue line is average, right? This is at New Orleans. So again, this is flow on the y-axis, timeline on the x-axis. So in 2019, we're way above average, right? So this box right here is hurricane season. So if you take 100 years of hurricane data, that's when the peak hurricanes happen, all right? So we came into hurricane season way above average. All right, so very unique, not a good situation. So lo and behold, with the river coming in, we have a system developed in Kentucky uh, that moves off to the coast. And before we know it, we have a, a hurricane that's forecasted to come and we're at a high river um, in the lower Mississippi River. So early forecast of the river, I mean, uh, the hurricanes that come right up the river, not a good situation, high river hurricane on top. Uh, we had some really scary forecasts. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately for some, I guess, the, uh, the hurricane shifted uh, to the west uh, in the last 12 hours. So that 20 forecast was reduced. And you see, we, we never got to the 20. We only got to about a little lower than 17, but a couple of scary days there. And so Morgan City, which they went to 10, which is only a half a foot higher than they've ever been because the hurricane went south, I mean west. All right, so that was a quick breakdown of the 2019 flood. Thank you, Joey. And Joey's going to be here for the panel, so we'll hold our, our questions if we can to then, and that way we can move on with the program. I thank you so much for taking your time to come today, Joey. Okay, next up we have uh, Mr. Brad Barth, who is... Uh, Mid Basin Sediment Division Diversion, excuse me, uh, Program Manager for CPRA. Brad has uh, more than 20 years of experience in geotechnical engineering and project management. He currently holds the position of Operations Assistant Administrator for Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority for the CPRA Operations Division, where he has worked since 2015. Over the past 10 years, Brad Geotechnical uh, Engineering practice has exclusively focused on flood risk reduction projects for dams, structures, flood walls, and levees. Brad has worked on uh, flood risk reduction projects for New, from New Orleans, Louisiana to Folsom, Oklahoma, uh, excuse me, Folsom, California. He served as a lead geotechnical engineer for Dallas Trinity River Levee certification project for the city of Dallas. Currently, he serves as the program manager for the Mid Basin Sediment Diversion Program. Uh, Brad has uh, received a master's degree in civil engineering and geotechnology and from the University of Cincinnati in 1997 and is a registered professional engineer in the states of Louisiana and Texas. And Brad's going to talk to us today about the uh, Louisiana plan, and we thank you, Brad. Thank you. All right, y'all have to bear with me today. I got a little bit of a frog in my throat today, so if I cough, I have a bottle of water ready to go. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Brad Barth with CPRA. I'm the Assistant Operations Administrator. I'm also the Sediment Diversion Program Director uh, for both the mid Barataria and the mid Breton projects. Just to give you a little bit of um, 
where we're going to go today. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction, kind of hit a little bit about CPRA, who CPRA is, how long we've been stood up for, and what our goals and objectives are. I think we have a, a lot of close alignments from what I've heard today from the state of Mississippi in terms of natural processes. Then we'll dive in some background on sediment diversions, and specifically the Breton sediment diversion, which I think is the most concerned here to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And then we'll get into talking about some misconceptions and some differences in projects. So Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. 2005 was a pretty bad year on the Gulf Coast for a lot of folks, Hurricane Katrina and Rita. After that, our legislators in the state of Louisiana saw a great need to integrate coastal protection and restoration under one authority. And that's what exactly what we did. Um, from different levy districts to different state agencies handling different components of flood protection and restoration, this really brought us together as a state to have one voice for our coast uh, from southwest Louisiana all the way here to the west and the East Pearl. What's at stake? We all know on our Gulf Coast we're seeing land loss, we're seeing sea level rise, we're seeing subsidence. Since 1932, and this is measured data, this is from USGS, since 1932, we've seen over 2,000 square miles of coastal Louisiana disappear. So I don't know how many folks are up on their uh, U.S. Uh, state, state information, but 2,000 square miles is larger than the state of Delaware. So imagine that, in over 80 years, we're seeing an entire state area disappear off our landscape to be gone forever. When we look at our coastal master plan and the direction the state of Louisiana is moving in, we look at a couple things. We look at what's potentially are projected to come forth. So we look at subsidence, we look at sea level rise, we look at a low scenario, we look at a medium scenario, we look at a high scenario. This right here represents a high scenario. Notice the areas in red, that's all land that would be lost with doing nothing. You'll see some areas in green. I'm going to go ahead and use this so I can use the pointer. You'll see some areas in green where we have active land building. So we have active deltas over here, Wax Lake and Atchafalaya Basin. One of the few areas in coastal Louisiana where we're seeing the exact opposite. Our coast is holding. It hasn't lost any ground and actually is growing. Same down here in the Bird's Foot area. But this is a high scenario of sea level rise. Significant land loss projected over the next 50 years. Uh, if we look at the lower moderate scenarios, it may be 2,000 square miles. So bottom line, over the next 50 years, we're potentially up against a fight of our lives, 2,000 to 4,000 square miles of potential land loss. And I'm not going to top uh, Joey's presentation just right before me, but it's good timing. Why are we in this predicament? We go back to 1927, unprecedented flood in the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, directly triggering, triggering the Flood Control Act of 1928, leading to the design and construction of our MRT system, which Louisiana and folks have a great hand in working with the Corps of Engineers on. It's not complete, as Joey pointed out, and there's still a lot of work to do on the MRT. But the great importance here is that massive flood from 1927, over 150 levee breaches, 250 folks uh, deceased as a result of that flood, let, led our nation into a different direction in terms of navigation and flood control that we've never seen before. And that also didn't come with uh, changes. With those changes, we've also seen, as Dr. Paul pointed out earlier presentation, that changed that natural process. So what we had in 1920s or 1930s is not what we have today once we have levees and flood protection in place where we don't have that natural process to let that water go where it wanted to go naturally 100 years ago. One item that the state of Louisiana took upon itself at the direction of our legislator is our coastal master plan. This is a plan we put out every six years. It's a $50 billion plan. It's not that we have $50 billion, but it's what we think we may be reasonable to find in terms of funding over a 50-year period. Um, 
This is really a program that we do every six years to vet and put the best projects on our landscape. We use it as a priority list. So every six years we prioritize our projects that we want to implement over the next six to 10 years for funding for implementation. And what this does is, this allows us to adapt and adjust to our changing coast. It allows us to collect data, information, and see results on our coast in terms of how we evaluate projects, how we see projects built, and how our projects perform. So that way in six years from now, we can reprioritize our projects and, and, and put the best projects, so the biggest bang for our buck, on the landscape every six years. So if you saw a project in 2017, it may not be in our coastal master plan in 2023. Uh, some may remain, some may be constructed. It's a way we can put the best projects on our landscape and deal with the data that we see real world on the ground every day. I'll go ahead and talk a little bit now about sediment diversion program. I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Hopefully I'll be able to provide some information today that uh, will get us going in the right direction. And like um, Joey had a little bit earlier, I have a similar slide deck to kind of talk about the history of the lower Mississippi Valley, our MRNT system, and the general construction of the Mississippi River, how it's varied and in, in tracked from as far west as Texas over to the Mississippi-Louisiana border. And I won't spend too much time on this since Joey already had a good presentation on this, but again, the moving of our deltaic lobe and different channels of our lobes back and forth as we get to present day locations. And for any of those that uh, have either traveled to South Louisiana or been over to visit us, or if you're from there, you know these deltaic lobes as they move back and forth also provide us our strongest ground. This is where we live, this is where we build our communities. We build it on that strong high ground because it's the best ground that we have. All right. Dr. Paul talked a lot about natural process, and I think that's where the state of Louisiana and the state of Mississippi have some alignment here. Reconnecting the river. Prior to the MRNT system, we had a lot more openness to the natural levees, allowing that water to spill out across our Gulf Coast. You can see here by this slide the amount of sediment deposition, or the sediment leaving the river system. Either here, this obviously is the year the Bonnet Carry was, was operated. Over here, we have more um, Wax Lake Outlet in the Chafalaya Basin. And then here, Lower Mississippi River. So Southwest Pass, South Pass, all the passes are here along the east side. All that sediment is not making it into our marshes. All that fresh water is not making it into our marshes. All those nutrients aren't making it into our marshes. You can see here, Terrebonne, Barataria, Breton Sound Basins. It's extremely starved of that sediment, freshwater, and nutrients. You see over here, Wax Lake and Chafalaya Basins, not, not separated from that freshwater, nutrients, and sediment. Green, looks healthy. I'll have another slide here to talk about that in a minute. But again, getting back to natural processes. Um, I call this the happy face, frowny face side slide. If we look at this, again, over here, Wax Lake Chafala, happy face. We look over here, this is Barataria, this is Terrebonne, this is Breton, frowny face. Some of our highest rates of coastal land loss are in these areas that aren't connected to the river. Again, natural processes. Brings us to our two projects. Just, tool, just one tool in our toolbox. When we look at restoration projects, we look at barrier islands, we look at shoreline erosion, uh, we look at um, marsh creation through dredging, we look at sediment diversions, we do look at hydraulic projects in terms of getting water to where water needs to be at. Mid Breton is on the east bank of the Mississippi River around River Mile 68. Mid Barataria on the west bank of the Mississippi River around River Mile 61. Uh, if you're familiar with any of the coastal towns, 
Um, Barataria is in the Ironton, Louisiana region, if you're familiar with Ironton, Louisiana. Sediment diversions. We've seen some examples of different types of spillways and diversions today. We have spillways or diversions for flood control. Sole operation purpose is just flood control. That's the only consideration in the operation. We have other diversions further up used as part of the flood control system, but for saltwater uh, intrusion, to fight back and hold back our saltwater intrusion, which is another contributing factor to the degradation of our marshes. Uh, Davis Pond and Carnarvon would be examples of those. They're only operated based on fighting back saltwater intrusion. They're not operated for any other reason. And then we get to sediment diversions. When we see that break in the natural process or the natural cycle, allowing the Mississippi River to spill over into the estuaries and into our marshes, um, for good reason, obviously, with navigation and flood control, very important to our country, very important to our economy, very important to our community and our citizens. But with the sediment diversion, the goal here is to design, operate, and build based on the premise of maximizing that sediment and minimizing that water. So now I'll get a little bit of information about mid Breton we'll talk about today. And I can't stress this enough, and I think Chip brought this up early. Uh, we're in the very infancy of this project. Um, and I'll give some details and some timelines here. Um, but I won't have much detail here to share with you today because we're just starting this project on the mid Breton project. I'll give you some details of what I can today and provide more information about upcoming meetings and progress of the project, but I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here now. Again, River Mile 68 at Wills Point. So this is a, a bit up further um, than the lower Mississippi River and some of the passes you may be associated with on the east side. Um, when we look at this project, I'll have some, a slide here to show some details, but it's going to have an invert about minus 25 to minus 35 feet in the river. It consists of about a 1,400 foot wide corridor going from the river out into the basin. And it'll have um, a, a capacity of up to 75,000 CFS. And similar to, um, this, is not, this is a passive system. So it doesn't run on a series of pumps. It uses the natural head and the power of the river to transport the sediment. So we rely completely on the water in the river versus the water in the basin to transport the sediment. Um, this is one I want to hit on a little bit in terms of the location. East bank of the river, River Mile 68, so significantly up river of the end of our flood protection. And as Chip talked about, quite a big distance from coming out here into the Breton Sound, up through the Chandelier Sound, through the Mississippi Sound, back to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. So I want to make sure that's clear today for everybody. Hopefully, we've been able to provide some information on the location of this project. Um, a little bit more detail, a little bit more zoomed in here at the Wills Point. One of the reasons we look at sediment diversions for the river power is also to capture the heavily concentrated sediment that we see in the river that occurs naturally in that natural process of our point bar de deposition. So we know in point bar deposition that we can have uh, both the the silts and the clays that naturally come down in the wash load. And then we know so we also can capture bed load sands and also catch any secondary current and a corkscrew kind of effect as it comes around that turn that puts all that sand up on that sandbar. So that makes these ideal locations to where we can find these locations that have the best uh, river power that we can use to maximize that sediment concentration. I'm gonna skip to a little bit of a schematic so I can give you a little bit more idea about the project. Um, again, inlet out here in the river, minus 20 to minus 35, it would come in here. This is the MRL, the Mississippi River Levy. We'd have a gate complex behind here. So um, Joey presented earlier with the um, Old River Auxiliary Control Structure, if you've ever seen a picture of that. Uh, this would be a similar style structure with tainter gates um, located here, so it would be controlled. Um, and then a guide levy system out into the basin. Uh, we do have one highway here, Louisiana Highway 39, it would have to be relocated. Um, and then this would be channel and guide levees out into the basin. So those are kind of the major components of the project. 
And again, this is a very, very early stage. Uh, this is a conceptual layout um, to start the environmental permitting process, and that's really where we're at right now on the project. I'll come up with a show you a timeline here in just a minute. So these projects will go through the permitting process with the Army Corps of Engineers as the lead federal agency. And with that, we'll have to acquire a Section 10 for navigation and a Section 404 for jurisdictional wetlands. And this kind of gives you the three different paths of the, of the overall permits. And then with submitting the permit, triggering the NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act, or the EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, if you're more familiar with that term. Um, so we have the permit process, we have the NEPA EIS process, and we also have 408 as we'll be altering or proposing to alter the MRNT system, specifically Mississippi River levees. So right now, uh, for Breton, back in January, we submitted the permit. We've gone through the public comment review period on the permit, and right now we're in this area here on the EIS where we've started it, and we're looking for um, to get the, sco the scoping meeting scheduled with the Corps of Engineers. Most likely that's gonna happen quarter one or quarter two of 2020. Um, I wanna highlight here, these shaded boxes, this is where public input happens. This is where our, our local communities, our states, our, everybody has the opportunity to put in comments, questions about the project, and it is truly just that, public scoping. It drives the scope of this document, the environmental impact statement. And like again, I said, I believe this will occur sometime probably quarter one, quarter two of 2020. Um, typically in the past, they've done three public meetings at different locations for folks at three different dates, uh, try to make it convenient. But that's generally the process. This is a lengthy process too. This is not something that happens quickly. It's not something that gets taken lightly. It's not something that gets rushed. Just this process alone is probably about a three year process at a minimum uh, to go through this process. Some of the items that the EIS will look at in terms of impact. So it's looking at impact to the public environment. Anything from social economics, environmental justice, water quality, the nutrients in the water, how that may be affected, our aquatic resources, fin fish, shellfish, oysters, and so forth. Um, our fisheries, commercial, recreational, and then marine mammals. So you see here a pretty extensive list. With this list, there's on an order of 84 laws, rules, and regulations that go with that list in terms of evaluating that impact. So quite an extensive list. You can see why uh, something of this nature to evaluate this project and determine uh, potential impacts and then work through with these impacts. Once these impacts are identified, we have to go through a process of avoidance, minimization, or mitigation. If we don't do that, then we obviously we wouldn't be able to get a permit for our project. But our goal here is natural process. Restore that natural connection from the river to the basin, but also have the best project that's in the best interest, interest of our Gulf Coast communities and the, and the folks of Louisiana. Timeline. So again, this is a little bit on the rough side. Um, as I do not have exact times and dates yet on the EIS because they have not been agreed to at this point in time or they have not been provided to us by the Corps. Um, so we are here coming up on the end of the year again. I expect this to happen probably about mid next year. I'm not sure if this is closer to the end of the first quarter or closer to the second quarter. We certainly will keep folks apprised because we want the input to drive to get the best project. Um, the draft EIS Final EIS. Again, I have placeholders here 2022 and 2023. I do not have exact dates on these yet. Um, as Chip said, we are in the infancy of this project. You can see from where we're at today to where potentially our schedule would get us to a record of decision where the Corps of Engineers could make a decision on our Section 10 and our Section 404 permit is roughly over four years right from today. When we look at a construction schedule, this is a mega construction project. Um, so with that, 
we're looking at probably five years of construction in the river in the fast lands. So timeline, uh, if everything went toward the schedule, construction went well, we had a lot of low water years on the river, um, you'd be looking at 2028, 20, 2029 20, before first operations. So this is not a project that's getting built next year. It's not getting operated next year. We have a long road to hoe on this project with a lot of information to put out and to gather to provide to folks so everybody can have the information transparently to make informed decisions. Some of the next things that we have going on. Data collection. Dr. Paul talked about data collection. We're on the river constantly with Tulane University, uh, USGS, and other folks collecting river sediment samples uh, at this site location for, for um, Breton, also our other project, and also up at Belt Chase for a lot of data that everybody uses on the river that manages and touches the river. Other items that we have going on are field data collection for our geotechnical borings uh, for overall engineering and design of the project. And we're heading towards the next preliminary plan set, which would be 15% plans and specs. Um, again, scoping, this is really the key point. This is the next public input, um, quarter one, quarter two of 2020. And for that, we look to get comments, questions about what you think of the history, what you know of the project, what you know of potential alternatives. Put in your comments. It's important to us. Uh, to make sure we have the right information to put the best project on the map. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here today kind of talking about some differences, and I think Joey hit some of this on Bonacari um, in 2019 and so forth. Uh, again, I, I want to point out some differences here between a potential sediment diversion and Bonacari. And one thing I want to start with is location. Location is important. So on Bonacary, we have it emptying into Lake Ponce Train and then coming through the Wrigley's into the Mississippi Sound or through the Chandeliers and then into the Mississippi Sound. It's got a pretty direct conduit corridor to make it over to this direction. Think of it as water coming out of your gutter, your downspout, heading, heading down your driveway to your patio. It's got a quick path. When we look at Breton, and I'm going to show you some slides here on Breton, Breton's going to be further up in the watershed. It's going to be rechanging the kind of the water flow in the lower east section of the river that's uncontrolled right now in terms of no levees. So it's going to be shifting around that flow pattern. I'll show a slide here in a second. But that water would have to then come out into the marsh, travel through miles and miles and miles and miles of marsh, make it to the Breton Sound, Chandelier Sound, and Mississippi Sound. We don't have all the answers here today, but we're going to be going through the process to get the answers through the permitting process. But I want to just talk about those are some of the major differences. Um, some of the other major differences, obviously, Bonacari is operated solely for flood control. That's the only consideration. It's operated in, by the Corps of Engineers. Our project would be operated by the state of Louisiana. It would be strongly tied to looking at the flood season because that's when the sediment's coming down the river during the flood season. With that, though, different operations. We're looking to have adaptive management to consider resources, consider environmental conditions. Um, flood control doesn't have that, that opportunity sometimes. It looks a little bit different. And I know right now we're having conversations with the Corps and everyone on what that looks like going forward in the future. So with that, uh, a lot different looking there. Unprecedented year. 1927, as Joey pulled out and we pointed out earlier, is pretty a monumental year for our nation in terms of flood control uh, from the Mississippi River, even to if you look at some hurricane activity in South Florida in those years and some other areas. But it, it really set the bar for the direction we went as a nation. But again, look at this slide right here, 2019. This is days above flood stage at Red, Red, Red River Landing. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy bad. Um, it's monumental. It's unprecedented. Getting back to the location on Breton. Again, we're going to kind of zoom in here. You have Bonacary here, out through Ponce Train, over to here. Um, down here, mid Breton, River Mile 68. These red lines represent ridges. 
This is one of the interesting components of the, the geography and geology of the Breton Sound. It's sub, sub segmented by small ridges and barriers and so forth. It also probably one of the reasons why we've been hit hard with some hurricanes over the years uh, because it's so compartmentalized. That storm surge gets in there, it builds up, it's got nowhere to go. Um, but Breton right here comes out here, has to make the right turn, come all the way down here, and then would have to work its way over 100 miles back up to the Mississippi coast as a crow flies. Um, the other one I want to pull out too, um, John may be familiar with some of these, but uh, we wanted to pull out some slides and just talk about the lower river. Because when we talk about Breton, the sediment diversion is 75,000 CFS. This is March, um, probably third week of March last year, 2019. Um, and one thing we want to point out that really a blow about, this is the end of um, NOV2 right here, the levee segment on the east side of the river, which is Bohemia. Below Bohemia, we have no longer any man-made levee protection. So this section of the Mississippi River from Bohemia all the way down to South Pass, when it gets to certain elevations or stages in the river, it's free flow out into the sounds and the gulfs. And I want to point out this number. This includes South Pass. So in March of 2019, 630,000 CFS out of the east side of the river. And I want to notice here these yellow shaded lines. This is a salinity map. So out here we have the sound. As Dr. Paul talked about, 35 PPT salinity on the other side of the, on the islands. Um, so we have our Gulf of Mexico. We have that saline block. And notice here we have these saline contours blocking this water out of here. If you remember the slide I showed earlier on sediment, um, we also see a similar pattern in a lot of the sediment where it makes it out here and then just works its way out or settles out. But again, what I wanted to point out here, this is what we had. This is not even Bonacary. This is all down here in the lower river. Bonacary, we were up in the 150, 160, 213,000, depending on which opening it was. And the other thing I want to point out is Dr. Paul talked about is the fresh dynamics of all the different freshwater inputs um, from the Amy River all the way over to East and West Pearl. Um, a lot of folks even in Baton Rouge don't realize, but Baton Rouge drains to Lake Pontchartrain, drains through the Amy system, co system. It doesn't go into the Mississippi River, even though we're 50 feet away from it. Um, so a lot of freshwater inputs, you can see up here, very, very fresh. Obviously, this is when the Bonacary was open. Um, you can see the salinity line holding at the, at the islands. We come back to a 2017 year. Bonnie Carey did not operate in 2017. We see a real similar pattern. High flooding, high river output here on the east side of the river through all our openings from Mardi Gras Pass all the way down to South Pass. Um, several hundred thousand CFS. And again, without the Bonnie Carey operating, we see very fresh conditions in the lake. Lake Pontchartrain, uh, Lake Bourne, Lake Catherine, and in, uh, into the Pearl River Basin. So we have a lot of freshwater dynamics happening. Um, I think the takeaway here today is duration, magnitude and duration for such a long time, from September of 2018 through August of 2019. Duration of this unprecedented event is really what's affected us. So going forward, I want to kind of put out a couple of ideas here and, and outreach and in different ways that folks can engage us. Um, <clears throat> our master plan goes through numerous public meetings. We go through solicitations of projects through um, private citizens, local communities, municipalities, parishes, uh, coordinating with the state of Mississippi on our working groups and so forth. Um, same thing into 2017. Our next master plan is kicking off right now for development and production in the 2023 timeframe. In addition to that, project specific for the Breton EIS, again, scoping meetings, we expect sometime in 2020, first or second quarter. Um, public um, review in terms of the draft EIS, 2022, and then final EIS in 2023 timeframe. And with that, just kind of pull up this last slide again, showing the kind of the bar chart there on that process. So not a quick process. 
And in fact, um, some of our folks that, that we may get beat up a lot of times for going too fast. And sometimes we get up for going too slow. So with that, I thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Brad. I appreciate it. And uh, once again, informative information. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break. And uh, we have some uh, refreshments out in the lobby if you'd like to. We're going to try to stay to about 15 minutes, just give you a little bit of a break of what we're doing. This is also the opportunity, if you want to ask a question, please, there's the cards in the back, put them in the little, uh, there's some uh, little baskets on each side as you come into the uh, auditorium and have them, and we will bring them forward, because that's how we're going to operate. We're not going to operate with open mic. We're going to operate with questions brought to me, and then I will ask that to the panel. So uh, to all the ones that have briefed already, thank you so much. We appreciate your efforts, and we appreciate you bringing your thoughts to us, and then we look forward to the panel. So please, let's go have a little small break, small break. <laughs> 